Uh, let's turn to uh, the biblical text today for our time of preaching. First Kings chapter number 19 is where we'll spend our time. This is a lectionary passage, part of our um, consistent efforts to be aligned with uh, a majority of the global church preaching through uh, the biblical text uh, one week at a time using uh, certain select passages, believing that God can speak to us collectively together if we literally allow the word of God to take full root in our hearts. First Kings, uh, don't preach from First Kings very much, but it's worth saying that if you are familiar with the, the way the Bible is structured, you will find that the, what we call the Old Testament is often referred to as the Hebrew Scriptures. It is uh, the record of God's activity, uh, primarily starting with Abraham, who was and is the father of or is regarded to be the father of uh, at least the three major religions of the world, the Abrahamic religions, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, all kind of find their origin in Abraham. Father Abraham used to sing a song in Sunday school. Everybody remember that song? Father Abraham, have many sons. He used to, everybody got their arms. That's how the kids learned it, right? We all, and it's funny, we all didn't grow up in the same church. Folk grew up in churches all over the country. Everybody, me, his hands start going this way, right? <laughs> That's what happened when you have children's church, right? Everybody just learned it the same way. I don't know if there was a book or a video. But yes, I learned it that way too. And Father Abraham had uh, all these sons, and, and Jacob, ha or Father Abraham had two sons, and uh, no, one son, I'm sorry, named Isaac, and then Isaac had Jacob and Esau, and then Jacob had 12 sons, and, 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 and but there was another son that uh, was uh, uh, kind of had by uh, the, one of the handmaidens. Uh, of, of Abraham, and that son is regarded to have kind of been the father of the Arab nations, if you will. And so you just have all these cultural kind of, of origins that go back to Abraham. And so it becomes kind of a diversion point in the biblical text where you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, commonly called the Torah. That is the primary kind of sacred text, if you will, of the Jewish uh, religion. And they use these texts to remind themselves of their covenant responsibility with God and in turn God's covenant with them. And then you have what is called the historical books. And those are 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. And all of these uh, texts that follow the Torah that help lay out the historical journey of the Jewish uh, people moving from folks who were in bondage in Egypt to folks who literally became their own standalone kingdom. And so you have the historical books. And then you have the major prophets. Why do you need a prophet? Because we as human beings are hard-headed. Somebody say amen. We all got a, you know, our own sense of what we think should happen. And we think that our, our thinking is better than God's thinking. And so God sends a prophet to kind of redirect us and remind us that there is a way of life and interacting with one another and worship of God that should be done in adherence to the covenant, the promise that we made with God and God made with us. And so the prophets come along. They try to keep getting the children of Israel back into right relationship. And so you have the major prophets. Then you have the minor prophets. And then you have the wisdom books, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And so if you were to take all of the Hebrew scriptures and put them together, you would find what I would call best described as an encyclopedia of God's activity in history with a group of people that literally we as Christians extend from because Jesus was a Jew. He was a Jew with a lot of melanin in his skin. Somebody say amen. Living over there in the central part of Africa. Somebody say amen, right? And so we all need to just appreciate that this is all a part of the continuous work of God in the world. And we extend from that to a way of life and faithfulness that allows these texts to still speak to us, even though they were written thousands of years ago. 
They have a continued revelation for us. They have a continued uh, kind of arrow to point you and I towards the age-old lessons of God and remind us that God is not seeking to be in relationship to us purely through the pages of the sacred text, but God wants to live inside you, around you, through you. Whew. That's some heavy stuff, right? God want to live inside you. It's like, do I really want God inside me? God wants to live around you. Do I really want do you got stuff we do every day? Do I really want God around me? So it's like, I'm running from God. Somebody say, man, I'm trying, God, you give me some space so I can have some fun today. God wants to work through you. Do you really want God working through your hands, your feet, your mouth? Whew. Nevertheless, it is God's desire to be so proximal to us that we cannot distinguish between the distance between God and us. And this is the sermon message and lesson for today. It is a message that I feel compelled to lift up to us, finding God in unlikely places. The first Kings is where we'll spend our time preaching from. We're going to jump right into the biblical text, uh, verse, chapter number 19, verse number 1. Uh, now, you've got to appreciate the backstory. There is a prophet named Elijah. He was one of the major prophets, and he was one of these folks who were trying to get the children of Israel, the Jewish uh, nation, particularly here in the text, who had made a covenant that they would only worship one God, Yahweh. And because they were finding themselves with leadership at the top of their country that was actually introducing other kinds of religious practices, Elijah showed up on the scene to compel the children of Israel, hey, we must remain faithful to our covenant commitments. And there were some other prophets who were very comfortable lifting up the God of Baal, if you will, in this text. And so Elijah, one prophet against these company of other prophets, 40 prophets. And if you were to read chapter number 17, they had this big showdown on a mountain called Mount Carmel. It's not the one up the street or up the road, you know, where you can look into the Pacific Ocean and get lots of... Whatever you want up there, somebody say, man. It wasn't quite like that. It was a mountain. And you got to appreciate that mountains in the biblical text represented places where you could meet God. A mountain was a place that was elevated in nature. It was a place that required some effort to get there. Why? Because there was this thought that if you made a trip to the top of the mountain, God would bless your effort and meet you there. And so they had this showdown at the top of a mountain, and they built altars. And, and Elijah uh, built an altar, and the, the prophets of Baal built an altar. And they were sitting there, and they said, okay, Elijah said, listen, why don't y'all go first? So, so they go first, and they out there, and they calling on their God of Baal to come and do this miraculous thing to the altar, send fire and send all this stuff. And they were cutting themselves, and the scripture says, well, all this kind of stuff. Nothing happened. So Elijah says, okay, it's my turn. So Elijah says, matter of fact, before I do my prayer, I want you to pour a bunch of extra water on here. And, you know, I, I, I want this, this, this altar to be just dripping wet because I believe the fire of God's going to come down and it's going to just like, envelop the whole altar. And so Elijah was in many respects kind of making fun of them. You know, Elijah, you know, I don't know if, you know, he was led by God to do that. If he just, you know, a little, you know, full of himself, feeling himself. Somebody say, man, you know how you be feeling yourself sometimes. Anybody ever know you've been right in a situation? Like, you know you right. You know they wrong. And so you just kind of like, oh, I, oh, yeah, I'm about to pour this on, you know. I'm, I'm just not going to be right. I'm going to be, like, good and right. I, I want to embarrass you with how wrong you are. And I feel like that was, Elijah's moving in that spirit. And long story short, Elijah makes the prayer, and the, and the scripture says a fire fell from heaven and enveloped all of the, the, the altar and et cetera, et cetera. And the prophets of Baal suffered a major defeat at this showdown. And the king and queen of the kingdom at that time, Ahab and Jezebel, 
literally got so mad because they were siding with the prophets of Baal that they literally were trying to chase Elijah down and kill him. And so we pick up the story here where Elijah is on the run from the government. <laughs> Somebody say, man, Elijah, Elijah is, 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 you know, he, he ain't in a car, he in a chariot or something. He, 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 he bobbing and weaving, he's ducking and hiding. He's like, now I've done the right thing, God. At least I thought I had. How is it that when I do the right thing, I can still end up on the run? You ever felt like that? I did the right thing. I, you know, I didn't knock them out. I didn't cuss them out. I didn't, you know, you know, sneak and steal and get the most out of this thing. I told the truth. Pastor told me to forgive. I forgave. I let it go. I let it slide. You know, he was talking about anger management a couple weeks ago. I, 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 I kept my anger inside. I smiled. I grinned. <laughs> How's it? I'm on the run. <laughs> this is a human experience, a regular experience for we who are trying to follow the ways of God in a culture that is literally anti-Christ. All right? And, you know, I'm not talking about anti-Christ like the, you know, apocalyptic revolution, you know, revelation. You know, this, it's so fascinating. I'm, I'm getting long-winded. I can already tell. I ain't read the scripture yet. But ain't it interesting... Ain't it, ain't it interesting that people know a lot about revelations? If there's one book people know a lot about is revelation. Everybody knows how the world's going to win. And people become a pastor. You know what? The world, you know, the, the Antichrist is here. I was like, oh, really? Ain't that interesting? I mean, I, in my lifetime, adulthood, there's been at least four or five Antichrists. And most of them have been the political leaders we don't agree with. You know, I, I didn't like George W. Bush, so I thought he was the Antichrist. Folk didn't like Barack Obama, they thought he was the Antichrist. Folk didn't like Mikhail Gorbachev, he was the Antichrist. Folk didn't like, uh, what's the, the guy down there in Venezuela, he's the Antichrist. Folk didn't like Trump, but we was right. No, I'm just, like, <laughs> no, I'm, just I'm messing around, I'm messing around. I, I would not dare give Trump that much significance. But isn't it interesting that everybody's real clear about who the Antichrist is? Yeah. But they don't know nothing else about pretty much anything else in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> it, it does gesture to this point that we can tell that something is wrong with creation. The scripture says in Romans chapter 8 that all of creation is groaning. Right? All of creation is, 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 is literally going through these birth pangs because creation realizes there's something happening that is out of alignment. How is it that we can live in a world that God created that has enough for everybody? And yet the places with concentrated capital, our cities are literally overflowed with people sleeping in tents and cars outside. How is it that we have resources in abundance in the earth, but yet you have a few number of individuals who are able to extract the wealth of the world they did not create and make for themselves kingdoms and castles and leave the precious creation of God out of the ability to benefit from it. It is this kind of groaning that I want you and I to appreciate is where God seeks to meet us. Because for many of us, we often think that God only meets us in the spectacular. But I want you to know God can meet you in the most unlikeliest of places. All right, I'm not gonna read then the whole chapter because I done talked away 10 minutes of my reading of the book. But I'm gonna start 
In verse number four, first Kings chapter number 19, literally Elijah was said he was afraid. And so Elijah got up. Verse number three says, and fled for his life came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. Judah was again, a part of the two kingdoms, Israel split and Judah split two kingdoms. And he left his servant there. But Elijah himself went a day's journey, verse number four, into the wilderness, came and sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he asked that he might die. Elijah said to the Lord, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the broom tree, fell asleep, and suddenly an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Now, I know for many of us, you know, this just sounds so spectacular. It's like, Pastor Mike, you seem like a very educated man. You'd be reading these fire fell from heaven and, and angels showing up and cooking bread on hot stones and water appearing. Now, you believe that stuff? Yes, I do. Because I've seen some things that happened in my life that did not have much explanation. Can I tell you one story? It still to this day, it just blows my mind. I remember I, was, I, I had just flunked out of UC Davis. <laughs> I went to UC Davis. I got set at UC Davis on engineering scholarship, and I was up there playing video games and spades on the call it the quad, and I just didn't go to class. Thought I could, you know, just skate through because, you know, I had a high intellect, so I thought. First year, I failed, and so I didn't tell my parents. They're not here, right? No, they're not. So I told her, oh, you know, I had a rough first of my year, so I just had to, you know, go to summer school in the summer. So I literally drove to UC Davis every day for the whole summer to make up my classes. And one of these days, I was driving up the, uh, the uh, 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 Highway 80, and I was running out of gas because I had to go get my check from UC Davis to put money in my car. You know, I was trying to hide from my parents and all this kind of stuff. So... I end up pulling over to the side of the road near one of these emergency stations. And I walk to the station, I look down, and I see $20. And I said, look at God! <laughs> this, is, I'm tell, this is a true story. I'm not embellishing it whatsoever. So I picked it up. And I kept walking, I looked over, and there was another $20. And I kept walking, and there was a hun altogether $120 of cash in the weeds and the brush on my way to pick up this phone to call the gas man, you know, the, the tow truck gas people to come and put a liter in your... $120. I don't know where that money came from. I don't know why I was neatly sprinkled <laughs> on the ground. And I just happened to stop right there. I don't tell that story a lot because I don't like people know I flunked out of UC Davis, but I just felt I needed to give you an unexplainable story. <laughs> And if you keep living long enough, you're going to have an unexplainable story. Somebody say amen. All right. Back to the Bible, though. You know, I'm going to finish reading this before I try to preach for 15 more minutes because we got to take communion. He ate, and when he got his strength, verse number eight, he went in the strength of, listen, that 40 days and 40 nights he journeyed to Horeb, the Mount of God. He ate this food and traveled 40 days. And at that place, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah answered, I have been very zealous for God. The Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, throw down the altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. And they're seeking my life to take it away. Elijah giving God his sad story. Anybody ever felt like that? God, I'm, I'm tired. I've had enough. Just, you know, just give, 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 give me, you may not ask for God to like take your life, but you're like, God, I'm just, 
I'm a, I'll say when I get frustrated, I'm a shell of a man. I'm just, ain't a whole lot left up in here. Anybody ever told God that? You know, you know what's so important? Sometimes, you know, we, we be lying to ourselves and God and just be thinking, like, you know, I can lie to God. I ain't got the, God, I'm good. <laughs> You're just a broken person. Elijah told God the truth. And the word of the Lord uh, came out to Elijah. And the scripture says, verse number 11, go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. Listen, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And that's the earthquake of fire. Oh, surely, God, you know, gosh, I just had a good encounter with this fire. Oh, my God, it's a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. Verse 13, and when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And then there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So how do you find God in unlikely places or how perhaps may you begin to look for God in unlikely places? Let me give you three quick ways that come from this text that really, I believe, can be instructive for us. Now, when I preach, when we preach, we are not attempting to give you this kind of ironclad prescription, although there are some prescriptive components to the Christian faith. We do believe that salvation comes through Jesus. And so it is a prescription for us to accept Jesus and, and walk in the ways of Jesus. But I want to describe a description of how you may find God in unlikely places. The first thing that I think the text teaches us is you must trust the process of your journey. Often, you find God in the journey. Many of us begin a journey thinking that the best part of the journey is the destination. But I want you to appreciate, child of God, that the destination is only the finality of the process of you moving from point A to point B. The journey is just as important as your destination. The scripture says that the angel of the Lord came first to tell Elijah, hey man, you gotta get up. You, you sulking. I know you had a hard time, but come on, get up. Then the angel came the second time and said, listen, I'm gonna feed you. Why? Because you got a journey to undertake. And he fed Elijah, and the strength that Elijah got from that intervention with God's messenger gave Elijah enough strength to make it to the next point of his journey. Your journey, wherever you are, your journey of faith, your journey of vocation, your journey of your career, your journey of your relationships, your journey in your own self-discovery, God is present with you along the way of your journey. And there are things and conversations and lessons you will learn along the way that will be indispensable to you as you prepare yourself to arrive at the destination. I love my children. They're wonderful people. But my children love phones. I mean, they love phones. I think they love their phones more than their life itself. And they will be in a car driving through anywhere, uh, you know, monuments. And all they will do is look at their phone, at TikTok, and Facebook, and Reels, and be back there giggling, ha, 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 And they're like, do you see the Grand Canyon? 
Do you see Yosemite? Do you realize people from all over the world come here, pay thousands of dollars? But, but what's the big, what is it? Well, you, you, have to, you have to pay attention on this journey through monuments rather than being consumed by what is in front of your face. How many of us cheapen the journey because we're so distracted along the way or so focused on the destination? I wonder how many lessons did you miss out on because you did not think that the journey was just as important as your destination. I wonder how many of us got to a destination and realized, man, I should have took advantage of some lessons along the way. Because now that I'm here at the end of this journey, I am not fully equipped to maximize my presence at this destination. You see, God allows your journey to almost be some preparation time. God allows your journey to be a time where you run into some messengers, some angels, some folk who can minister to you and speak to you and help you get through some of your angst, anxieties, and disappointments. But if you are so preoccupied with the destination or that thing in front of your face, you will not allow the journey to be a place where you meet God and literally become transformed along the way. There is a gift in the journey. If we can trust that God, you are going with me along the way. There's revelation in this journey. There's growth happening on this journey. I run into divine provision <laughs> in the journey. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, now, you know, uh, going back to my story with all the money on the side, it's never happened to me again. And, you know, believe me, you know, I pulled over a few times and I was looking on the ground. And I was like, all right, God, I mean, if <laughs> you want to, you know, hook a brother up, <laughs> I'm open. I mean, my, my pastor, first lady, San Jose, they said, I'd have kept walking all, I'd have kept walking all the way till, till I got all the way to UC Davis. You could have paid off your education just walking up and down the rough highway. But what that journey moment taught me is what I've heard the elders. We got a few elders here today who, you know, would say, oh, baby, I remember a check came in the mail. Oh, baby, I remember, you know, God made a way out of no. Where do you think they get this stuff from? They get it because the journey has taught them time and time again that if I can just be faithful to God along the way, God will teach me and show me that God is faithful. The worst thing about young people like myself and younger is we've not lived long enough and we've not given God enough time or we've not been reflective enough to appreciate that God carries you through your journey. Amen. We think it's because of our own strength. We think because we got a lot of luck and a lot of education, a lot of connections. But I want you to know there's some moments in your journey if you could just take a time and be still and you could be honest and say, if it had not been for the Lord. Lord, I got to keep going. But give your neighbor a high five and tell them, trust your journey. Trust your journey. God is going to show you something. Ooh, I feel, I feel happy about that. Amen. But I, 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 we can't celebrate so soon. You be careful over there. He trying, to, he trying to pull something out of a preacher that want to preach the old black church style. Uh-huh. But I'm going I'm to I'm be a little more luxury today. Mm-hmm. The second thing you must do is embrace your season of caves. Caves. Y'all know what a cave is, right? The scripture says that Elijah, after his journey, he went and found a cave and he was hiding out. Now, that makes sense. <laughs> if you want to run from the government, you're going to find a place to hide out. 
He didn't be walking up and down the street. <laughs> oh, they're trying to kill me. I'm just, I'm just walking. No, you strategically going to move from one place to another. You ain't going to just be out there waiting for them to, you know, knock your head off. Hello, somebody. So he found a cave. And the scripture says that he found the cave and he slept there overnight. I want you to know, child of God, that there will be seasons in your life where you will have a cave experience. So your journey is your journey, but your journey is not always just great experiences. Sometimes you need a cave. How many have ever driven to Los Angeles or taken a road trip, right? I'm one of these people, I've driven across country six or seven times, five times by myself. And I, I love it. Why? Because I'm one of these people who, as soon as I get on the road, I'm ready to get off the road. I don't like road trips with people who just want to make stops all the time. It's like, oh, man, pull over. We got to go to bed. I said, bro, we, we just, what are you talking about? It's just, we, we just left the gas station. Why are you going to go to the bathroom there? Oh, I didn't have to go. Man, it was 30 minutes ago, bro. Man, why are you tripping? I'm like, bro, I'm, we try. Come on, man. Then I'd be looking like I'm just the grouch, right? But the years of traveling, I got used to certain places to stop. One time I stopped in a sundown town in Texas. I never stopped there again. <laughs> and I walk in, get my gas, and everybody looked at me. And, you know, I had to put my HP mug on. Like, what's up, bruh? Well, well, I'm just getting some gas. What's up? You know, he start, you know, spitting out tobacco. And <laughs> I said, all right. Well, you know, I heard of what y'all be doing down here. So, you know, just give me $5. Don't give me 20 Just give me 5 Let me get, get down the road. But what I realized along the way that they have rest stops. Places where you can pull over and get some reprieve. Sometimes I will pull over and just get a couple, night, a couple hours of sleep, and then I'm back on the road. Sometimes a cave along your journey is intended to give you some time to recover. Now, it's very important to appreciate a cave can either be a place of recovery or a place of isolation. And it usually depends on how long you stay there. If you stay in a cave too long, you will find yourself isolated. You can't live in a cave. I mean, I guess, I guess technically you could, but caves are not meant for you to live in. In the context of your journey, sometimes you just need a place of reprieve. All throughout the biblical text, David found a cave when he was on the run. Jeremiah, these, these, these folk, they understood if I'm on the run from the government, I better find me a cave. Well, when you are going through the course of your life and you're having hard times, some questions I think you should ask yourself, because Elijah was in a cave because of his fear. And it was justified fear. I mean, you know, Ahab and Jezebel were known for killing the prophets of God. So Elijah wasn't just out here unreasonable, like, oh, man. No, Elijah, he, he had a right to be afraid. So fear drove him into a cave. But guess what? He also was exhausted. How I many know sometimes exhaustion can drive you to a place where you need to recover along your journey? But you need not stay there past the point of your recovery. Just like a rest stop is meant for you to stop and then keep going, you don't see houses built next to rest stops. You don't see condos. Hello, somebody. You don't see nice estates. You see a poorly attended set of bathrooms, maybe a drinking fountain that may or may not work, some grassy area. It is intended for you to stop and what? Keep moving. But don't, don't miss out on the opportunity to stop and trust that as you get some recovery, listen, some questions, ask yourself, what are the things that are triggering me that has put me on the run? 
What are the things that are causing me to lead towards isolation rather than recovery? Who are the people that God is putting in my life so I don't have to stay longer than I need to? And when God calls me by my name, it's leading to my last point. God meets me at the cave. Oof. So think about this, child of God. God will give you some direction. Go on this direction. God won't always give you the destination. Because that's what happened with Elijah. God tells Elijah through the messenger, hey, get up, clean up, eat. You're going on a journey. Where am I going? Just go. You go, you end up in a cave. Is this where I'm supposed to be? God says, okay, I'm going to meet you at the cave. Now, the key here, this is my last point, is to tell the difference between God's presence and God's activity. How do you find God? You learn to distinguish between God's presence and God's activity. God shows up at the cave and Elijah was not expecting God to meet him at a cave. But it's important to appreciate that what we know about God is that God is always present with us. There's nowhere you can go where God won't be there. David learned throughout the course of his journey, if I make my bed in hell, literally the place of non-existence, God, you're there. If I make my bed in heaven, the highest points of my life, God is there. If I make my bed in struggle or in triumph, God is there. But how many of you know God can be someplace with us and we not even be aware of God's activity? And so the scripture says very powerfully here that God shows up, warns Elijah, hey, get ready to come out from your cave because I'm about to meet you outside. Now that's, that's deep too. Can't talk about that too long. But ain't it great to know God will meet you outside of the places where you are trying to either hide, isolate, or recover? You don't have to always meet God. God will come meet you. Have any witnesses? God, you met me. I, I, and, you know, it wasn't even that. Elijah was looking for God. But God came to see about Elijah. And for some of us, I hope we learn sooner than later that before you started looking for God, God was on the lookout for you. Despite all of your idiosyncrasies, despite all of your ups and downs, your, your decisions, your choices, you think you disqualified yourself, but God said, no, that is part of your journey. You are being qualified, and I'm finding you Right where you are. Why? Because God says there's some things that I want to do in and through your life that I can only do if I meet you wherever you are. I know the church sometimes has this really kind of weird, uh, we call it ordis salutis in the, in the, in the, in the Latin, this, this kind of linear uh, uh, presentation of how salvation happens. Well, you got to get yourself right and come to God, and then you say the ABC prayer, accept, believe, confess, and then Jesus comes to your life, and then you just brand new, and then you just live happily ever after. But I have found that God's activity in our lives is not linear. God's activity is all over the place. <laughs> God be active when you don't realize it and be inactive when you be looking for God. That's why it's important to keep reminding yourself, God, you're present with me. And the scripture says, listen, that the, there was a great wind. The wind was so strong, it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. And the Lord was not in the wind. Surely if God just told Elijah, I'm meeting you outside, then Elijah's probably thinking, man, God, why are you tearing the mountain up? <laughs> but God was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. 
Sometimes it's important for you to appreciate that God is not in all or actively involved in all of the upside down turbulent moments and seasons of your life. God can be present, but God's not in it. There's a difference between God's presence. Uh, The best way I can describe it is God is present to keep you from falling. God is present to catch you when you fall. God is present to nurse you when you're injured. God is present to keep your eyes and your heart and your spirit tender. But God is not active in the things that are destroying or disrupting or tearing apart your existence. When God gets active, God heals. God don't tear things apart when God gets active. God puts it back together. Some of us got, you know, such a really distorted view of God. We think God don't like anybody but us. God don't like them, him, her. But God like me. And I'm glad I'm not like them, him, and her. Well, that's a small God. You keep that God, keep him right in your pockets. If God is so smart, only God likes you, then you are literally worshiping yourself, which is one of them idols that Elijah just got done defeating. Hello, somebody. God is big enough to embrace all of us at the same time, meet us at the same time in different moments of our life, and remind us through the sound of a sheer silence. I can't preach on that because I'd be here too long. But I am grateful that God speaks to us through the sound of silence. That God don't need to have the thunderous, verbose, bloviating kind of voice and rhetoric, but sometimes God just speaks to us through the softness of love. through the tenderness of touch, through the warmth of God's spirit. Some encounters with God, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm done, are so tender that they stay with you longer than the lightning bolts that shoot across your life. You find God wherever God shows up. And often it is an unlikely place. It may be along, it will be along your journey. Your destination is not the only place God will show up. God will show up with you along the way. Somebody say, God, help me to find you along the way. Help me to find you along the way. God will show up in your caves. You hide out. You trying to recover. You got questions, concerns. You got criticisms, you got anxiety, unresolved anger, fear, and pain, God will guess what? Meet you in your cave. God ain't afraid of you. I think, oh, God can't handle all. Listen, God ain't afraid of nothing about you. Literally. Ain't nothing about you intimidating God. God like, oh my goodness. Can you believe they like that? God like, oh, I've seen it all before. I've been here for a while. <laughs> Don't give yourself that much credit. God can meet you wherever you are, and God's presence is perpetual, but God's activity is very particular. Don't ascribe everything to God's activity when sometimes God's presence is there just to hold you until God gets ready to move. Stand with me, everybody. We getting ready to pray. The communion, I'm going to invite them to come and prepare us to receive the gifts of the Eucharistic celebration. Before we do that, grab somebody by the hand if you don't mind, next to you. God, I wanna pray for the person I'm touching today because I want you, God, to remind them that they can find you in some of the most unlikeliest places. You can show up and do miracles, signs and wonders. You can show up and just in the course of their breathing and their existing and their recovery, give them a tender 
experience God that penetrates the harshness of the season they're enduring. You can show up, God, not in the earthquake, the fire, the wind, but you can show up in the sound of sheer silence. God, I pray that my brother, my sister, my loved one I'm touching today, I pray that they will know that you, God, are present. That you, God, are at work. That you, God, are with them. And may they find joy in the journey. Squeeze their hand gently and just say, joy in your journey. Tell them that, joy in your journey. May they find God in the caves. Squeeze their hand gently, just say, find God in the caves. And God, may they know the difference between your presence and activity. Somebody say, Dif difference between presence and activity. God, give them what they need for the journey. God, they want to find you, so may they find you. Now lift those hands right where you're standing. God, it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it's not my father, my sister, or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. I need healing in my body. I need healing in my mind. I need healing from the trauma and the, 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 the anxieties and the violence and the disappointments and all of the things that have over the course of my life caused me to question and to, to doubt that you are active and present and, and, and you mean good things for me. God, I'm on the run from the government. I'm on the run from the evils of, of, of systemic and structural evil. I'm on the run, oh God, from my own personal choices and my own failures. I'm on the run because I've been hurt and harmed and dropped. But God, I pray as I'm on the run, God, that you'll run right alongside me. That I'll know that you are there and I'm never alone. And so God, with my hands lifted, I receive your love. I receive your power. I receive the lessons along the way. And I know that I can find you in the most unlikeliest of places. And so God, may you show yourself strong. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Give two or three people a high five or a hug and tell them I'm looking for God in the unlikeliest of places. I'm looking for God in the unlikeliest of places. Thank you.